If repetition is the key to success, then I don't mind reminding you of these four kinematics equations. We can find the position of an object by multiplying half of the sum of the initial and final velocity multiplied by time. And you recognize this just as a way of saying multiply average velocity times time. But this is only a valid expression for average velocity in the case that acceleration is uniform. Final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Position is also found by multiplying the initial velocity of an object times the time it spends moving, plus this additional term, one-half at squared. But take note, if an object is moving and it has an initial velocity but zero acceleration, this whole term goes away. And now this equation is nothing more than distance equals rate times time, the good old-fashioned dirt equation. Final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus 2 times acceleration times displacement. So collectively, these are our four kinematics equations. And they come with this special caveat that they're only applicable in cases where acceleration is uniform. So that begs the question, how do we study the motion of objects for which the acceleration is non-uniform? So in that case, we go back to our definitions of velocity and acceleration. Average velocity is a broad change in position divided by time. If we narrow in on a very small interval of time, then the average velocity turns into an instantaneous velocity. So we're still dividing some distance by time, but we constrain ourselves to very small distances in very small time intervals. So dx dt gives us instantaneous velocity as opposed to a broad delta x over t for average velocity. Likewise, acceleration, and I guess there's three lines in these equal signs. This is a definition. Acceleration is equal to a broad change in velocity divided by the time it takes to make that change. And um, to be precise, this is just a way to find an average acceleration. Instantaneous acceleration is found also by taking a change in velocity divided by time, but we limit ourselves to a very small change in velocity that occurs within a very, very infinitesimally small duration of time. If we stick to these descriptions of velocity and acceleration, then we can solve problems involving non-uniform acceleration. Here's an example. An object travels along the x-axis according to the equation. I'll highlight it. x equals 30 plus 4.5 t squared minus 0 0.75 t cubed. And we're asked, what is the object's initial position? What is the object's initial velocity? And what is the object's initial acceleration? So let's answer that before we even read the rest of the question here. Um, Initial just implies what's going on at time t equals 0. So it's worth copying this equation again. x equals 30 plus 4.5 t squared minus, how about I change it from 0 0.75 to 3 fourths t cubed. OK. Uh, well, then, our velocity at any instant in time can be found by taking the first derivative of position with respect to time. So this gives us, what, 0 plus 9t minus 9 fourths t squared. And in turn, acceleration is the first derivative of velocity with respect to time, which I suppose means it's the second derivative of position with respect to time. So this will give us. 9 minus 18 fourths t. Now what this equation is saying is as long as time continues to increase, the acceleration will also increase. So this is definitely an expression of non-uniform acceleration. This is an acceleration that becomes, well actually wouldn't, in, as time increases, the acceleration in this case is going to decrease because of this negative term right here. But in any case, that definitely represents non-uniform acceleration. It's an acceleration that is absolutely dependent on the value of time. Now, to get the initial, 
all we have to do is plug in t equals 0 into this expression. Well, that's going to make both of these terms drop to 0. So our initial position is simply the 30 that appeared in this original equation. And it's to be implied anytime you see equations like this that the numbers given will provide for metric units in the final answer. So it's safe to assume what we mean here is 30 meters. If we want the initial velocity, we'll plug in t equals 0 into the equation we derived for velocity. Well, that means every term goes to 0. So we can say initial velocity, or v naught is 0 meters per second. What about our initial acceleration? Well, yeah, you guessed it. We're just going to plug in t equals 0. This term drops out, and our initial acceleration is equal to 9. Now, 9 what? Yeah, it's safe to assume 9 meters per second squared. So that's it. Uh, fairly straightforward. Let's look at the rest of the question. What's the instantaneous velocity at t equals 1 second? So go back to our formula for velocity. Velocity was the first derivative of position with respect to time, and that gave us an expression. Velocity is a time-dependent equation that says v at any instant is equal to 9t minus 9 fourths t squared. So if I want to know the velocity at t equals 1 second, I just need to plug that in, and I find that the velocity is equal to 9 meters per second minus uh, 9 fourths. What? That's the same thing as 2.25. Right? I'm sort of, I, I know 1 squared is equal to 1. So I think my math is correct here. And this gives us 6.75 meters per second. OK. What's the average velocity during the first second of motion? Let me show you the wrong way to answer that one. It would be a mistake to say, well, velocity at time t equals 0, we already found out was 0. And the velocity at uh, 1 second appears to be 6.75 meters per second. So the average velocity, well, let me just add these two velocities and divide by 2. No. Average velocity is only equal to one half of the sum of the initial and final, only in cases where acceleration is uniform. But we decided, without a doubt, this is a non-uniform acceleration. So the way in which we calculate average um, velocity, we have to find what's the change in position during the first second of motion. So. If we uh, divide that change in position by the time it takes to make that change, there's the average velocity. This is our definition of average velocity, right? OK, so let's find out the position at 0. Well, we've already done that. That's 30 meters. So what's the position at time t equals 1 second? So that would be 30 plus, that's, well, 1 squared is 1, so 30 plus 4.5 minus, and 1 cubed is also 1, so minus 0 0.75. So let's see, 34.5 minus 0 0.75, I guess that's equal to 33.75. So our change in position would be this final position of 33.75 minus our initial position of 30, and all divided by the time it took to make that change, which is just one second. So really, we're just getting 3.75 meters per second. All right? And notice that's something uh, different than what you would have determined had you taken the average of 0 and 6.75. OK. Let's try another example along the same lines. A particle moves along the x-axis according to the following equation. And then we have to answer questions A, B, C, and D. Now, without even reading those questions thoughtfully, it's probably just a good exercise immediately to say, oh, I recognize this as a problem in non-uniform acceleration. So let me find the velocity by taking the first derivative 
and I get negative 5 plus 6t squared. And let me find the acceleration by taking the second derivative, which gives me 12t. So once again, this is without a doubt a clear case of non-uniform acceleration because the acceleration does indeed depend on the amount of time involved. So what's our first question? Find the initial position. So when we plug in 0 for t, we get x equals 15 minus 0 plus 0. OK, so x is equal to 15 meters initially. What's the initial velocity? v is equal to negative 5 plus 6 times. OK, so the initial is negative 5 meters per second. Got it. Part C, find the instantaneous velocity at a time of 3 seconds. So v is equal to negative 5 plus 6 times 3 squared, which is 9. And 6 times 9 is 54. So negative 5 combined with 54 gives us 49. And we can assume that means meters per second. So we have our value of initial velocity. Oh, I'm sorry. No, not initial velocity. I completely take this back. No, no, no. We have our velocity at time t equals 3 seconds. OK, moving on. When is the acceleration equivalent to 10 g's? Now, 10 g's, let's translate that. That means 10 times 9.8 meters per second squared. Oh, that's pretty easy math. When is A equal to 98 meters per second squared? What would be the corresponding value of t? So we look at the equation. If acceleration is 12t, that implies t is equal to A divided by 12. So we're looking for an acceleration value of 98 meters per second squared. So if I divide that by 12, now what are the units for this 12? Those have to be assumed as well, right? All of these numbers should have corresponding units, and they weren't stated. This 12 has some units to it. Um, I'm pretty sure the units would be meters per second cubed. Now, the reason I think that is I know the meters have to cancel, and in the end, the combination of units is going to have to give us seconds. So yeah, that's the only way it would work out. Anyway, if you reach for a calculator, uh, you find if you divide 98 by 12, you get about 8.17 seconds as the time required to reach this large value of acceleration. Curious if you caught a trick involved here. If you want to find the initial position, what you're really looking for let me write this expression a different way. You're looking for a term that you can pluck out of this expression very easily. So what if I were to rewrite this as x equals 2t cubed my, uh, plus 0t squared. There was, no, there was no t squared term. There's a t to the first term. But there's no t squared, so I'm safe to say 0t squared minus 5t to the first plus 15, how about 15t to the 0? It's kind of strange to write it that way, but anything to the 0 power equals 1. So I can rewrite this 15 as 15 times t to the 0th power. Now, why would I want to write it like this? Because then it's in a more general format. x equals at cubed plus bt squared plus ct to the first plus dt to the zero. And the reason for putting it into that general form is you can always find the initial position just by looking at what is the term that goes along with the t to the zero expression. And that will always be equal to your initial position. And your initial velocity is always the term that goes along with the t to the first. So our initial velocity is negative 5 meters per second. In fact, what if I were to take this expression and take the first and second derivative of that? Let me write this again down below. In general, if we can express position as a function of time according to the formula 
x equals at cubed plus bt squared plus ct to the first plus dt to the zero. Okay, so if, now that you understand, I'll get rid of the first, and I won't write t to the zero. Well, then our velocity would be equal to 3at squared plus 2bt plus c. So at t equals 0, that means v naught is, well, these terms would go away, and all we'd be left with is the c term. So yeah, whatever term goes along with the t to the first is our initial velocity. What about our initial acceleration? So acceleration would then be equal to 6at plus 2b. That means our initial acceleration would be equal to, when I plug in t equals 0, this term goes away, and it's equal to double the b term. So, for example, in this case, we're looking for whatever the b term is, and then we want to double it. But our b term was 0 in this case, so our initial acceleration was 0. Let's go back to the previous problem and see if we can find what our b term was. So the b term is the one that corresponds to the t squared. And the initial acceleration should be double the b term. So our initial acceleration should be 9 meters per second squared, which is exactly what we determined previously in that example. So what if we kept going? What if we took a third derivative? So we've got our initial equation for position. We took the first derivative to get an equation for velocity. We took a second derivative to get an equation for acceleration. What if I took the next derivative? Well, of course, this would give me just 6a, right? b is a constant, and the derivative of a constant is 0. This is t to the first, so yeah. Now, what is this? I'm going to put a j here. So we know this is position. We know this is velocity. We know this is acceleration. So the name for this quantity is jerk. If velocity is the rate of change of position and acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, then jerk is the rate of change of acceleration. And when you have non-uniform acceleration, you certainly have jerk. So as long as there is some a term in the equation, in other words, a term that corresponds to the t to the third power, then there is a value of jerk. And the value of jerk will always be six times that a term. So the um, initial, the jerk in this expression Right, corresponds to the t to the third power. There is no initial acceleration because there is no t squared term. There is a t to the first term, so we know our initial velocity, and so on and so forth. So just a little uh, insider tip on how you can figure out quickly what some of the initial values are when position versus time is described in this way.